Good evening, everyone. Welcome to our neighborhood live TV. You know, our interviews that we've done with a lot of the local politicians, people running for office, and uh, very interesting personalities are coming out of the word work to do good, good things. And we have one of those with us now, Peter Gramerez. Peter, it's lovely to have you here. It's great to meet you. I'm glad to introduce you to everybody. Everybody, Peter is a very interesting guy. And uh, Peter wants to make a mark in the world and help New York out because he's done been very successful as a builder and very successful as a restaurateur. And now he's looking and saying, how can I help the city? And uh, Peter, it's really a pleasure having you. Thanks for coming. Pleasure is all mine. I love the platform. And I uh, anytime I get an opportunity to spread my message and help the best city in the world, uh, you can count me in. I'm, I'm glad to be here. Thank you so much. So, so, you know something, let's just start off with, give us your message. So listen, I, um, I, uh, I grew up in Europe. You know, I came over as an immigrant with my family when I was two years old. We settled in Hartford, Connecticut. But the couple of times that I came into the city when I was a young kid, I, that's all it took. You know, I got the fever. I, I wanted to be a New Yorker. So as soon as I got out of college, as soon as I was able to uh, make it on my own, I came into the city. I got involved in the nightclub business. And uh, then I got involved in the restaurant business while I was building homes in New York, uh, while I was building homes in Connecticut. I was also doing, uh, you know, club club life in uh, New York City. I got involved with the BJ Group uh, way back then, started doing their build outs, started uh, owning the restaurants with them. Um, and I just fell in love with the city and I've lived many places. And I tell you, once you get bit by the New York bug, there's no going back. You you always, always remain a New Yorker. Listen, and I, I, I want to add something to that. So yeah. living in Manhattan for 12 years, um, I, uh, I go out to LA to work in the film industry and I, I kind of migrated there and I'd come back and friends, you know, that, that, that my, my best friends for years in New York would then introduce me to their friends as, as, well, here's Greg from LA. And I go, Oh no, 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 no. I'm a New Yorker. I, 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 trans I, I travel to work and stay overnight for months at a time, but I'm still a New Yorker. You're right. Yeah. What's in your blood? It, it, there's a rhythm, there's a pulse, there's an energy to New York that just never leaves you. So it's yeah, you know, what people forget is so we, we have a couple of uh, candidates running now. I'm going to leave their name out because I don't want this to uh, I don't want to be trashing the competition. Right. But there's a couple of candidates running. Names are going to be left out who consider themselves New Yorkers because they have an apartment in New York. Right. <laughs> Even though they're in COVID, they leave the city. They don't come back till a year later when they think it's safe. <laughs> owning real estate does not make you a New Yorker. Anybody can own real estate. The Chinese own half of FIDI, and they're not New Yorkers, right? <laughs> what makes you a New Yorker is a state of mind. It's a state yeah. of heart. Yeah. It's helping your fellow man. It's sticking together when times are tough. This is what makes you New York. It's a state of mind and heart. It's not geography, and it's not real estate. No, you got I, I cannot stand by anymore. I have to step in. <laughs> and you know what? The last thing I wanted to do was leave my cushy life. You know, my partners say to me, what are you tired of sitting at the bar drinking and entertaining pretty ladies that you want to throw yourself into this mess? And my answer is, it is. This is the best city in the world. This is the city that gave me everything. I inspired my whole life to make it into this city. And now we have these people ruining it for us. And I cannot stand by and let, allow this to happen anymore. So listen, I have to step in. And I, I tried not to. I wanted to see what would shake out, who would who would present themselves that I could get behind. I mean, I got restaurants. I'll support you. We'll do fundraisers. There isn't anybody that I can stand behind and feel comfortable with my businesses, my family, and my fellow New Yorkers in their hands. So I'm stepping up to the plate. Well, listen, the decisions that are being made for New Yorkers and for New York restaurants now are killing you. Everybody's incredibly unhappy with what's happening for the restaurant. How are you dealing with that? And and what would you do with it if, if you became mayor? So, you know, we're we're a bigger organization, right? So we can borrow from Peter to pay Paul and things until things get better. We're also in a new unique situation where we've been in the city since 1983. We have a lot of loyal customers and they've kept us in business through COVID. So we're looking in that aspect. If I was mayor at the time of COVID, <clears throat> I wouldn't have not I wouldn't have gone down that path of building these makeshift huts in the middle of the street, right? Think about how ridiculous this is. If you go to um if you go to um an airport, they don't put you in a hut on the runway waiting to get on the plane. You go to a hospital, they don't put you in a hut until you have to wait for uh your doctor 
right? You go to the train station, they don't put you in the hot because these people, these companies, they went the high tech route with COVID. They replaced their filter, uh, their filtration system with the COV uh, filters that have this white light and it's been proven to kill the COVID. We could have done that in our restaurants. And for the restaurants that couldn't afford to do this, well, we could have given them grants and they could have paid the city back. We should have taken the high tech. Anybody who's a New Yorker knows on New Year's Eve, you can't just walk into one of the best restaurants in uh, New York City, right? You need to make a reservation. You have to follow the seating uh, times. We could have gone through the seating route. We could have said, listen, we're going to seat everybody at 5 o'clock. You get to eat till 6.30. Between 6.30 and 7, we have a company comes in, fogs the whole place with these chemicals that they do on the planes, in the hotels, the airports, uh, the hospitals. And then we sit the next batch of people at 7 o'clock. We give them an hour and a half to eat till 8.30, between 8.30 and 9. We defog the place again, get rid of anything that might potentially have any bacteria on it or with the COVID bug. And this is what we should have done. Instead, we took a, a step back in time. We built these unsupervised, unregulated huts in the middle of the street, seven foot ceilings, not even six, five in some of them, 10 foot wide. Oh, miraculously, the COVID is not gonna find itself in there. Come on, like who came up with these ideas? It makes no sense. But you know that is that's a great plan, by the way. I know I've never heard that before about the fact that have the different seatings, have an early seating, clean the place out, have another seating, have it clean the place out again. That's a that's a great point. Never heard that before. And on top of it, and because you know what, if you're a governor and you're a mayor, why don't you reach out to a restaurant group that's been in the city for 35 years? Why not reach out to other restaurants and say, listen, what could we do? to make it more safe to eat inside your restaurant. We would have came up with these ideas. I would have told them this, right? But no, nobody reached out to us. Instead, they locked us down. They put so many people, so many families out of business. They have no tax revenue coming in from the restaurant. And keep in mind, we are the second largest employer of um, of this of industry in New York City, the restaurants we have twenty five thousand of them in the five boroughs. We employ a majority of New Yorkers. We contribute to the the financial well being of New York City. Why would you shut us down? Mm. It makes no sense. You know something. This might be a good time to mention this, just because um, you happen to be um, uh, working with one of the best restaurants, Vice Cucina. You guys have been around since 1929. Actually, in a couple well, of years, you've been going in your 1926, century. 1926. 1926? 1926. Yeah. Oh, so, I was just a little boy at the time, but yeah. I don't really remember it. So, <laughs> well, look, so you, you guys are going to be uh, celebrating a centennial. That's an amazing well, track record. Well, 1926 in Milan, where we started out. Yeah. Then we came to New York with our second location in the world in 1983. Yeah. So we've been in the city since 1983. Yeah. Well, it's, it's an incredible restaurant. Everybody should go there. Um, Thank you. Uh, but uh, uh, Biche Cucina. But here's another interesting. You had mentioned before we, uh, w before we came on, uh, and it's about how, how New York is dealing with the restaurants. Tell us what's happening to your other restaurants, like down in Florida. It's a oh, great right. thing for everybody. So, you know, my, um, my partners and I, we always have this struggle, right? Like, I'm a New Yorker. They hate New York. You know, they love Miami. They love Palm Beach. Uh, one is uh, a California Beverly Hills guy. You know, like, they don't understand why I'm here. They, they just don't get it, right? In Miami, in Palm Beach, in Naples, in Orlando, where we have Beach A, we're having record breaker months during COVID. In Palm Beach, we had a record breaker December, we had a, a record breaker January, and we're off to a record breaker February. And it's because all my customers from New York City are in Florida. When I go down there and I walk through the dining room, they like bow their heads because they're afraid I'm going to see them because <laughs> I know you're cheating on me. You should be in New York City supporting us. So. <laughs> It's all because all the New Yorkers have gone down to Palm Beach. They've gone down to Miami. And I've been on, I can't tell you how many newscasts I've been on where everybody asks me the same difference. Well, what do you think it is? I said, well, let me see. New York City is democratically run and governed, and we're in a shithole. Wait, can you say 
Can you say that word? Yeah. I, I take the word back. I'm going to bleep myself. Okay? We're, is, we're, we're, on the, we're on the internet, and we're real people. We're real people. We're real New Yorkers here. You can say shithead. Okay. <laughs> so we're in, we're in a shithole position right now, right? <laughs> Palm Beach, Florida, that part of Miami is mostly Republican run. So I can only attribute that the fact that we're so successful there is because they haven't shut down the economy like we have in New York. We all know that COVID is a serious business, right? We all know that people have lost their lives. We all know this, but we also know there's a way to manage it and to work through it where you don't have to kill the industry. And this is the problem we did in New York City. And they panicked, right? Do you remember Cuomo? Every morning I'd get up and I'd have to hear a half an hour about Cuomo's mother and his brother. And I'm screaming in my living room going, I don't care about your brother or your mother. No offense. I care about New York City. How are you going to help us? He's screaming, we need 30, 40,000 respirators. We use 3,000. We need the ship coming in. The federal government has to save us. The Liberty ship came in. We didn't use it. Javits Center, we're going to turn it into a thousand beds. We think I, we had a hundred people in there. You know what I mean? Like we panicked. We panicked. We shut down the, the economy. And I, I admit in March, okay, we didn't know what was going on. But by April and May, we kind of did. And we still kept the city on lockdown where nobody else did. And it's, you know, you can call me the, the Monday uh, night quarterback, you know, sitting in an armchair and complaining about how the players didn't play and I'm not even on the field. I can understand that. But you know what? They overreacted. They panicked. The city is hurt. We're in a huge financial crisis. And it's all because of bad decisions. And even when we made a bad decision, they never took the steps to fix it and change it and learn from it. We're still making the same mistakes. And if I become mayor, we're not going to make those mistakes again. Absolutely so, not. So if you if you become mayor, uh, we noticed from your website, looking at it, um, and since you're mentioning parties, um, are you affiliating with the Republican Party? Because you don't mention it on your website. So here's the thing, right? Like, I'm not a politician. I was never a politician. I fed politicians. We've had almost every president through BJ when they do the, the union um the United Nations conventions every year. I, I'm good at feeding politicians. I never wanted to be a politician, right? But I find myself forced now to get into the arena and to do it. But people corner me on this and they ask me, what's your affiliation? They drag it out of me, right? If I say I'm a Democrat, ah, you know, you got this one side after you. If you say you're a Republican, ah, you got this side after you, right? So what I tell people is my true affiliation is New York City. New York City and their people, that's my affiliation. However, my business sense is leading me as a Republican for two things. It's a money's game. Politics is a money game. Every day is all about raising money, raising money, and raising money. And if you go as a, lib um, as a liberal you're not going to have any money because there's no coffer. There's nobody to help you, right? So I had to pick either the Democrats or I had to pick the Republicans. I went with the Republicans because as businessmen, I'm always business-minded first. I have three Republicans running, so I might as well get into that arena because it's going to be easier to compete. Then you got 38 Democrats running, right? It's going to be a smorgasbord. These people are going after each other. I might not even be able to get my message out because the media is going to concentrate just on the front runners because they have so much money in their coffers, which that's a whole nother segment. You invite me back for uh, for my opinion on that. So my, my question, my answer is I am running on a Republican ticket, but I am a moderate. I'm a New Yorker and I just want to fix the city. I'm all for reaching across the lines to to negotiate with the Democrats, reaching across the lines to re uh, negotiate with the liberals, with the Republicans. All I care is that we have a plan to fix New York. But what I should tell you is I should do what de Blasio did. He ran as a communist socialist leader and he won. So maybe I should run as a communist and have the same effect. And that's just <laughs> a joke, by the way. I'm not a communist and I never run as a communist. But you know what I'm saying? I I I, uh, I can't imagine anyone not running as especially with ideals like yours not running as an independent. I uh, I take pride in the fact that I don't like either. 
I don't like the Republicans. I don't like the Democrats. They're all jerks and assholes. Oh, pardon me. So yeah, we're on the internet. I uh, I don't like any other any of the party politics at all anymore. I think it's hurting. I actually think it's hurting America. Absolutely, it's hurting America. But here's the sad part of it, right? It's a business politics. Politics is a money making machine. Every four years, the fundraising comes out. Uh, the conventions come out. Uh, people spend. Look at how uh, how much money was spent. Like five hundred million dollars in uh, Georgia for the governor's race. I mean, think about it, $500 million. What could we have done with that money? How many lives we could have saved? How many people we could have fed? So if you run as an independent, there's nobody to donate to you because you're not a Republican. You're not gonna get Republican money. You're not a Democrat. You're not gonna get the uh, Democrat money. And you know how much it costs just to try to run for New York City mayor? It costs, there, my guys told me to budget six to $8 million. Wow. Are you kidding me? That's so much money. I come yeah. from the business mind where, you know, $500, a dollar, you know, if we're off of our budget, that's too much. And now I'm having these numbers, $8 million just to run for mayor. It's, yeah. it's sobering, sobering. So let's, uh, let's let that take us into a segue about budgets. One of the things that I liked that you were talking about, uh, I saw it on your website, was the fact that, that uh, teachers are having to pay for school supplies for their kids and uh, for our kids to go to school. And you wonder where's the budget for our education? But then we have, and this is something, if you want, I would I would love you. If you wanna, um, there's, there's uh, Lorraine Grillo. She's the head of the uh, School Construction Authority. The School Construction Authority has a billion dollars to work with, to build schools. Yet they're going to build schools in areas that you, you don't really need it. Bayside, we just had an incident out here where the school construction authority wanted to build a school in a place that the, the whole town objected to it. It was three blocks away from one high school, four blocks away from another, right in the middle on a terribly congested area. But they were looking at it saying, why do you need to build a school here? They said, well, it's kind of populated and, and you're, you're, you've got too many kids here where other parts of the city, they don't, they have schools that are half empty, but our schools here in Bayside are full. So they said, well, you need more schools here. Instead of just changing and putting more money into the education, that we're putting money into a, a big bucket to build, build buildings, but not to actually educate the students. And that just makes me nuts. So when you go to want to look for money for schools, for education, you could look at the school construction authority. Do you need these billions of dollars to be sitting here doing nothing when you could be putting that into the education of the school so our teachers don't have to be paying for the supplies for this to teach their students with? Yeah, no, absolutely. It doesn't make sense. You know, this world has gotten crazy, right? People have lost their mind. People have lost the conception of what a dollar is, right? The city of New York City brought in $210 billion. Not New York State, just the five boroughs, $210 billion. That's more than some countries put together. And we're going into this fiscal period, $14 billion in the hole. Why? Because these politicians that are running this city and other cities across the country, it's not their money, right? It, it, they don't conceptualize money. It's like going to the casino when they give you a chip instead of using your money because you see 50 bucks leave the table. You're like, wow, that was 50 bucks. You see a chip leave and you say, oh, that's a, that's a plastic ring. That didn't mean nothing to me. It's the same thing with these, polit uh, these politicians, right? They have $210 billion come in. We're $14 billion in the hole because they're spending money on line, line items that just don't make sense, but it's not their money. When you make them accountable, then the dollar starts to become more realistic to them. And that's the problem we have. Let's spend a billion dollars on this. People throw a billion out today like it's $100,000. It's a lot of freaking money. Right. We have eight hundred and fifty million dollars missing from a fund called Strive that de Blasio's wife started. Nobody can find it. Like, where did it go? At Beach A, if we're missing five hundred dollars, somebody's going home without a finger. That's a joke again. I don't want all these people calling me up. OK, that was a joke. But we have eight hundred and fifty million dollars missing in the city of New York and nobody's saying anything. What is wrong with people? We should be rioting in the streets. We should be down Fifth Avenue with signs saying, where is the money? Eight hundred and fifty million dollars could have fixed the whole freaking school budget. Yeah. Look, you know, talk about, talk about the money and where it gets spent. I, I like your idea. You, I, 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 something I admired um, Bloomberg for doing 
He said, uh, what do we need to, to be spending? Why do I need to be living in Gracie Mansion? They saved the city a lot of money. Tell everyone your great idea about what you would do with the money that goes into Gracie Mansion. Do you know how much? So, you know, I have the New York City budget. Obviously, it's 374 pages. Yeah. It's, it's my bedtime reading, right? It, it just, it, 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 it aggravates me, but I have to go through it because I need to be uh, knowledgeable of what I'm talking about, correct? Gracie Mansion is running about $10 million a year between maids, housekeeping, uh, kitchen staff, security guard, uh, maintenance grounds, the whole, the whole nine yard, and security. Security is the big deal over there, right? Um, what do we need a mansion for? You're a freaking mayor. You're not a prince of a uh, bagatar, right? What do we need this kind of expensive real estate? My idea is this. We have 25,000 restaurants in New York City, right? We don't have a city-run culinary school. Let's stop the madness. Let's change this into a culinary school. And then let's give scholarship to the inner city kids who would never be able to go to a culinary school, right? And we have a backyard full of jobs. We got twenty five thousand restaurants. Let's teach our younger city, our our inner city kids. Let's give them scholarship. Teach them how to be a chef, a cook. A chef in a good restaurant in New York City like ours is one hundred fifty thousand dollars a year. That's a good salary, especially for somebody who doesn't have the means to go to Harvard or Yale or do something else. It's a great profession. It's a very loved profession. Then the other vacancies for this culinary school. Let's sell them to the spoiled rich kids in Italy, in Germany, in France. People that love New York City and would say, hey, I would love to go to a New York City culinary school. It's the best city in the world. We have the best restaurants in the world. Why not promote that with a culinary school? Let's stop the madness. It's crazy. I have my apartment. I like my apartment. I know where everything is. I don't need to be in Gracie Mansion. <laughs> I, I, I know the culinary schools, the famous ones down in uh, Soho, and but they're very expensive. Oh, and yeah, forty, fifty thousand dollars $50,000 a year. Yeah. So, so to, to have a city run and city paid for culinary school and to create those jobs out of that, I, I have no problem with that idea. I think it's a good but, one. Yeah, but you know what? It's not really going to be city paid because once we start charging the culinary admission to other people that have the means to afford to go there, even if we break even, we're still better off than spending all these millions to house, you know, politicians. <laughs> How, housing politicians, uh, a, New York, a line item in the New York City budget, housing the politicians, housing the politicians. Yeah, you know, you've heard of HUD, right? Yeah, yeah. So now we have HP, which is housing politicians. It's just <laughs> <laughs> Listen, by the way, before I forget, you and I have something, I, I understand you and I have something in common. I hope it's not a girlfriend. <laughs> well, it's close. It's close. It's not, well, uh, who, we, we, you know, the world's getting smaller all the time. We might know somebody, but but we do actually. We um uh, we were both on Housewives of New York. Oh, that, what season were you on? Oh, okay. it was like the second or third, a couple of them. But uh, I, I know the Countess from out in uh, the Hamptons, and I, I've done fundraisers out of the LTV. So whenever we do a lot of the party scenes, we're doing it in the LTV studios out there, and I'm always like kind of walking around talking to everybody. So, but I've known them for years and uh, shooting out there. So. When I heard that you were on Housewives of New York as well, and but you had a you had like a real storyline. I've just been yeah. kind of a party guy in the middle of. of the I was on, I was on there for a while. I have a, yeah. a wine called Tipsy Girl, which was featured on the show. I had a bar downtown, which was uh, involved with Ramona Singer. So yeah, I, I spent a lot of time on the Housewives. Um, and, and you and, and you don't, and don't you, hold it don't hold it against me. It was a business decision, right? We had three million viewers every Wednesday who got to hear about Tipsy Girl and BJ Restaurant. Yeah, but 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 you are you you got on Bethany's Bethany's bad side, and I don't see any difference between I don't see any likeness rather with Tipsy Girl and Skinny Girl. That I don't know what she was talking about. Yeah, but, first of all, nobody wants to be a Skinny Girl, right? And how could you even promote Skinny Girl? So you wear a T-shirt, Skinny Girl, and if you're not a Skinny Girl, people are gonna laugh at you, right? But if you wear a T-shirt that you're a Tipsy Girl, everybody in the world loves a Tipsy Girl. But Bethany thought you were kind of stepping on her trademark uh, or something. Yeah, Pepsi Cola, Coca Cola. She yeah. used to work for Skinny Cow. Then she started her own brand called Skinny Girl. Come yeah. on, there, there's enough money and love in the world for everybody. Can't we just get along? <laughs> Seriously, can't we just get along? So, so give me your 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 best idea for New York and and uh, and your best shot for everyone to vote for you. So I have a lot of ideas, but uh, the one in short 
that I think is my best idea. And I'm almost afraid to say because I don't want people to steal it. But if somebody steals and it helps the city of New York, I'm okay. But, you know, we have all these politicians walking around and nobody's talking about policy. Nobody's talking about what's going to happen. In a, I think it's a, about a week or maybe two weeks from now, the court systems are going to open up to the foreclosures, right? They say that half of New Yorkers are behind in their rent. They say that 80% of uh, restaurants and retail are behind in their rent. Once they open up the court system, the foreclosures are gonna be flooding our system. And what are we gonna do about this, right? Nobody's talking about the big elephant in the room because it's not an easy subject. It's not a sexy subject. So everybody's staying away from it. So somebody said, okay, What's your big idea? Well, here's my big idea, right? And I learned this because since we're a big company, since we are popular in the city, the landlords are more apt to work with us because they don't want to lose a major tenant. We're a good tenant for the building. And right now, everybody and their mother is calling me up and saying, take my space, a year free rent, uh, half a million dollars in a tenant improvement. I mean, they're throwing stuff at us. So the landlords are more likely to work with us. But I feel bad for the little guy down the street who has a pizza place, right? Who's behind $100,000 on their rent. So here's what we do, right? If it's Joe Schmo Realty that has the lease on um, Joe's Pizza Place, Joe's Pizza Place is behind 100,000. The city steps in and says, listen, Mr. Realtor, Mr. Uh, landlord, you're going to forgive 100,000 of Pizza Joe's rent. We're going to take 100,000 off your tax bill, which to them is great, right? If they have to pay $100,000 less, they're still whole. They didn't have to pay it in taxes. They saved it. Joe gets to stay in business. He gets to hire his three, four guys who in turn get to collect their uh, payroll to take care of their family. And here's what we do. As the city, we go to the federal government and we say, New York City is too big to fail. You gave $300 million to Nicaragua. You can give us a, a, a fund to help the city. We're the most important city in the world. You gave $12 billion to GM and Ford. You can give the same amount of money to New York City to save us. We can't fail. We are the center stage of the world. The federal government needs to step up and help the best and the biggest and most important city. And they need to do that. And as a mayor, I'm going to sure make sure that I get all my friends together. We get all our connections together. We go to the White House. We sit down and we save New York City. That's you know what something? You, if you just got all the votes for all the people who work in the restaurant business alone, you'd be doing pretty good, right? Because the amount of people that employs, like you said, it's one of the biggest employers in uh, in the city. Yep. And it's, it's hurting like anyone. I have my own friends in, in Broadway in the theater the, uh, industry, and oh God, that's getting killed. But uh, as soon as people are in, uh, in restaurants. Open up the city. I was on a plane to Palm Beach the other day, right? I had people bumping me in the elbow. You know, they say they saved the middle seat. Where do they save the middle seat? Because I was in the middle seat and I had a person on the left and on the right of me, right? So here I am for two and a half hours, crowded. I can't go to a movie. I can't go to Broadway and maybe skip the center seat or maybe skip every other seat. It's madness. Open up the city. Get life back on track. It makes no sense that Broadway is closed down. It makes no sense that you can't go see a movie. Open up the city. The revenue will start piling in and we'll be able to figure it out. With the city closed, with the revenue not coming in, with the courts getting ready to open up under foreclosures, we're going to be in a lot of trouble unless somebody grows the cojones, steps up to these people, and gets the city open and back on track. I don't want to move to Palm Beach. I mean, I'm a New Yorker. I live across the street. I live in Midtown. Please do not make me move to Palm Beach. <laughs> well, um, hopefully you won't. I um, And hopefully uh, hopefully uh, these vaccines that are coming out Absolutely. hopefully that will bring us back and everyone will feel safer. But Absolutely. um but I appreciate your time. So listen, I'm going to see you over at uh, BJ Cucina. Uh, it's on West 55th, no, West 54th. So we used to be on 54th between right. Madison and 5th. We moved over to 55th uh, yeah. almost four years ago. It was four years. Got so we're on 55th between 5th and 6th, yeah. yeah. Come by, we'll uh, we'll break bread and we'll, we'll we'll chat more about. So here's the thing, right? 
like I never talk politics. As a restaurant owner, you can't talk politics, right? Because yeah. you never know somebody, and especially in these days, everybody's so antsy. Everybody's so afraid about saying something wrong. So as a, a restaurateur, you want everybody to feel welcome. You don't want to be the guy that people get irritated by with politics. Mm. All I do now is talk about politics. People will be <laughs> like, oh my God. Yeah. Chicken Parmesan was the best. Forget the chicken Parmesan. Do you know what's going uh, uh, happening on the Upper East Side with these homeless shelters? Like, I can't even talk about food anymore. You know, <laughs> I, I, I got to talk about politics. Yeah. Hey, wait a second. Wait, before I let you go, I just realized. So, uh, so a good friend of mine, and uh, you, you might know him, but uh, uh, one of a great restaurateur, uh, Willie Deagle, owns Uncle Jack Steakhouses. Yeah, of course, of course, everybody knows. Uh, right around the corner from you, yeah. and he got killed because of Trump because of them shutting down the streets right there. How badly did that affect you? Oh my God! You're, here, you're right at the block from him. Yeah, it it affected us. I'll tell you. The other day, I got an Uber, and he would got on that street. I'm like, "Don't get on this street. You're gonna be stuck." And he's like, "No, they opened up the street again." We drove through and passed, and there was no mobs there. There was no uh, heavy guarded armored people and tanks and cops. It was actually kind of really nice. It was nice to see this area of Midtown get back to some type of uh, normalization. Uh, I'm happy to see it gone. I'm happy that the streets are opened up. And uh, that's the one thing, yeah, I, I don't miss about having Trump uh, as a president, just because Midtown is opened up now. You know, yeah. so I have a selfish reason, but uh, be as it may. Midtown feels a little bit better without these streets being closed off. There should have been some sort of compensation for the impact that closing those all, all those streets off for security purposes, for Trump Towers, that hurting those businesses around there was incredibly unfair. And I'm glad that you made it through there. A lot of other people didn't. Willie kept his other stores, but he said, you know, the, our, our Uncle Jack's on, uh, on 54th, he said, it's just, they're killing us over here. Yeah. So there should have been something that should have taken care of the local businesses around Trump Towers that all got closed down because Trump was president and because of the security issues there. Yeah, too. But you know what? We could also take it another step further, right? So this uh, this communist leader that's running New York City right now, Bill de Blasio, he decides he's going to paint the BLM sign in front of Trump Tower in Midtown, right? I'm all for BLM. I, I, things need to be fixed. The police need to be fixed. There has to be more tolerance. Uh, more tolerable policing. So don't get me wrong. This is not a, an anti-BLM. It's an anti-BLM sign right there, right? Because we have to hire policemen to guard this sign. People kept vandalizing it, throwing red paint on it. So, you know, he knew what he was doing. And this is what I mean about these politicians, right? He could have put that sign anywhere. But what does he do? He puts it in front of a guy's building that he doesn't like. There was a political screw you to Donald Trump. We're going to put it right in front of your building. He could have done it somewhere else, but he did it there, which also impacted the neighborhood, right? They have to guard it 24-7. Yeah. So, yeah, these politicians got to stop doing what they're doing. Yeah. Yeah, we need a better way. <laughs> we need a better way. There is a better, there is a better way. That's the, the, the fortunate thing is there is a better way. Well, listen. I, I hope you. Uh, I hope you get a shot to to bring us that better way. We and usually, as usual, with um, fun interviews, we ran over. But thank you. We're on the internet, so we're not really stuck by any particular time. It's been a real pleasure, Peter. I'm gonna. I'm gonna come over. I'll see you over at uh, uh, Beach Cucina. And, Pleasure's uh, all mine. You always have a table there. Just tell them you know me, and they're gonna sit you right by the kitchen by the dishwasher. <laughs> <laughs> thank you very much, my friend. Uh, thank, thank you for the platform. I love it. Thank you. Bye. I will tell Daryl I said hello. I will. I'm going to have dinner with him now. Yeah, our favorite Daryl Spivey. Great guy. Catch you later. Thank you. Thank you.